Okay, we are here to talk about privacy and compliance for nonprofits. I'm gonna put the chat over here so I can see it on my other monitor. So don't be offended if I look slightly away from the camera occasionally. Uh, we are here to talk about privacy and compliance or privacy compliance for nonprofits. Uh, though it annoys me to start this way, uh, I feel like somebody out there, particularly our lawyers, are going to yell at me for not saying this. I want to clarify uh, that I am not an attorney. Uh, I have no authority to give advice on immigration. That statement is true or other legal matters. In this case, obviously, emphasis on the other legal matters uh, as what we are talking about today is not immigration. But in case you expected me to give you legal advice on immigration, I'm also not qualified to do that. This is essentially a discussion of what, as the CEO of a marketing and advertising company, we've kind of learned about privacy compliance, how we've uh, encountered these topics with uh, uh, handfuls of our customers. Uh, obviously, if you have specific legal questions, uh, uh, about a potential compliance issue, you should take it up with an actual qualified lawyer. Uh, we're going to sort of roughly cover kind of three groups of topics with uh, the most emphasis on the first two. One is going to be an overview of the uh, regulatory environment. Uh, basically, what are the laws that we're going to be talking about that you're potentially concerned about being compliant with? Uh, and uh, then like, how do you handle your marketing and consent uh, to in principle sort of be compliant with those laws? We'll kind of talk about how compliance with those laws, it's not actually a very kind of well-grounded and well-defined idea, but the general thrust of the, the stuff that you should watch out for to err towards the side of compliance. And then this third topic here is, is really just kind of a brief discussion. Also, my voice just cracked. I'm 36 years old. Apparently, that still happens. Uh, is uh, data privacy and the uh, implication on the non-cookie apocalypse. Uh, if any of you are uh, we're here for the webinar that I gave in April that was about the cookie apocalypse. Uh, if anybody isn't aware of the fact that Google has canceled the cookie apocalypse, uh, that was formally announced, I believe, a few weeks ago. Uh, and so we'll kind of briefly cover at the end. It's like, what effect does that have, if any? The short answer is uh, it kind of fundamentally doesn't change the way that you should approach these sorts of compliance questions. It either will or will not remove one aspect of compliance that you would or would not have to manage. Um, also, the likelihood that there's any conclusion on what Google is doing in any short term uh, time frame is very, very low. Uh, as a brief background on Feather, we're a marketing platform, marketing and advertising platform that focuses entirely on uh, nonprofits. Our sort of two core types of nonprofits are sort of traditional 501c3s, uh, museums, theaters, charitable organizations, et cetera, uh, and 501c6s, uh, particularly trade associations. So on this uh, screen, uh, SME is probably the best example of one of our kind of traditional uh, uh, trade association customers. Uh, kind of core foundation of uh, Feather's belief is that marketing is sort of fundamentally a part of the mission of nonprofits. Uh, it's how you tell your stories. It's how you ask for help. It's how you uh, kind of act uh, on behalf of your industries, your communities. And it generates genuine impact uh, in those communities, in those industries. Uh, and so Feather is here to sort of support more, more effective, more productive marketing and advertising in the nonprofit uh, space. And here's just a couple of examples of more of our wonderful uh, customers. Uh, and I've never actually like really looked at these pictures. I don't know whatever's going on here. It looks cool. Uh, a little bit about me, um, CEO, uh, one of the co-founders with my partner, Aiden. Uh, I'm a gigantic nerd. That is essentially what qualifies me uh, for these webinars that, as it says here, they kind of let me out of my dungeon for. Uh, the more sort of technical topics, uh, certainly anything that kind of crosses hybrid uh, technical with potentially regulatory or interacting with other systems. Uh, that's why they dust me off. Uh, otherwise, more charming, more capable and competent speakers are chosen uh, for these webinars, which is why you don't see me that often. Although the fact that I gave one in April uh, is a relatively quick back-to-back -back for me. Uh, and we are going to start off 
talking about data privacy. I'm also going to find my little uh, screen here so I can cheat and see what the next slide uh, is. Let me move this over. Um, yeah, we're here to talk about data privacy. Uh, as ever, uh, for some reason, every single picture of data privacy is depicted by a person in some sort of weird version of like the matrix and heaven. Uh, this is apparently what data privacy looks like. Uh, I don't actually work in the data privacy industry. Um, so I'm envious of all of the people who get to hang out in whatever these rooms or uh, dimensions uh, are because this is every single picture of data privacy that is available on Google Images. Uh, so the first thing that I want to talk about is the regulatory environment. This is effectively like kind of a background about the laws that you probably need to pay uh, attention to. And I'll kind of explain what that sort of probably means, both in the context of the audience of this presentation, but also sort of broadly how they may or may not apply to you. So these sort of tier one laws uh, I'm kind of describing as like generally relevant for all organizations in that there's a decent chance uh, you may interact with uh, the kinds of people that these laws cover. So those two uh, are GDPR and CCPA. Uh, GDPR is the one that covers the Eurozone. Uh, and then uh, CCPA is the uh, CCPA and CRPA are the California laws. They're essentially the same law, but extended, expanded on in 2023. Uh, and so we'll go into a little bit more detail about those. But those are the kind of the two principal ones. They're pretty similar in structure, uh, at least from an overview perspective. Um, and so the kind of the sort of most important ones to talk about. Uh, the next group is uh, laws that will be very relevant but for a subset of uh, organizations. So VCDPA is the Virginia one, Colo PA is the Colorado one, and then HIPAA, which is not typically talked about as a sort of data privacy law per se. I mean, it kind of is, uh, it is very explicitly a data privacy law, but not data privacy in the context of marketing. Uh, there are some potential implications for how HIPAA can relate to marketing. We're not going to talk explicitly about that. I don't have any content about HIPAA, but if you have questions about HIPAA, how HIPAA may apply, I'm happy to answer them if I happen to know something about it. Uh, and then tier three is hypothetically relevant. Uh, the American Digital uh, Privacy Protection Act uh, is uh, it's a law that's currently in committee, uh, has been in committee since 2022, I believe. Um, there's no active action to move it forward, but if it passes, this would, I think, uh, or sort of obviously uh, encumber all, probably almost everyone on this call because it would then apply to every American company and every American citizen. But as of right now, there is no one law that covers every American citizen uh, from this list other than HIPAA. So as so again, brief background, GDPR uh, went into force six years ago, uh, 2018. Uh, I see this question, what I consider the uh, Canadian anti-spam legislation in with the tier one group. Uh, uh, CASL and CAN-SPAM, um, I, I, they're, they're kind of equivalent in that I think they're, they're very relevant for the particular thing that they cover, but they're not technically data privacy laws. They don't have the same structure as the regulatory frameworks that we're going to talk about in the sense that those are more explicitly rules about what you can and can't do from the perspective of like email marketing in particular. Um, and so those very much apply to anybody who is sending email to American citizens with can spam and Canadian citizens with CASL. Um, but that sort of structured in the same kind of uh, privacy compliance, uh, data rights privacy compliance way. Um, GDPR is the sort of original modern data privacy law. It's the one that kind of represents this fundamental difference between the can spam kind of laws and the ones that we're going to talk about. Uh, GDPR specifically applies to any organization globally when dealing with EU citizens. Uh, and essentially what that means is, uh, in principle, you have an American website, you're an American organization. If somebody from the EU goes to your website, uh, interacts with something on your site, uh, in principle, you are required to follow uh, GDPR. 
uh, the, the you're required to be able to enable the data privacy rights uh, enabled by GDPR. The main sort of importance right now in talking about GDPR is that it is the one that established this kind of core framework that the other laws that are potentially more relevant, the California ones, Virginia ones, the hypothetical American one, uh, American federal one, in that it uh, bestowed these sort of data privacy rights to individuals and then uh, created this sort of responsibility within organizations to be able to fulfill on those rights. Uh, California followed up a couple of years later with uh, a law, sort of really a pair of laws that um, in, in principle are structured pretty similarly to uh, GDPR. So CCPA uh, went into force in 2020. It established these kind of four foundational data privacy rights uh, which we'll go into a little bit of detail on. Um, and then I don't know if I'm supposed to say CIPRA, but I always say CIPRA, uh, the California uh, Privacy Rights Act went into force in 2023. It basically expanded on and provided more detail for the, the rights uh, that are established by the CCPA. Uh, you can effectively think of these as kind of one law. They're the California equivalent to GDPR. And these other ones that we talked about, there's the Virginia one, the Colorado one, the the, and the dynamic of all of these is pretty similar. Uh, the Virginia one affects uh, citizens of Virginia or residents of Virginia. The Colorado one affect residents of Colorado. HIPAA is a federal one. And the uh, American Data Privacy and Protection Act um, isn't, isn't a law yet. It's in the cartoon of the stairs and how law, how bills become laws it's still singing on the stairs somewhere, it has not been, um, uh, not even signed, it hasn't been taken to a vote yet. Uh, but who knows what happens? I think sort of the important thing to kind of keep in mind is that as written right now, uh, ADPPA is sort of structured very, very similar to the California one and the GDPR one. Um, the, this is the kind of principal sort of concern question that everyone has when talking about these is like the penalties associated with these as well as the qualification structure, uh, I will, uh, uh, I'll kind of sort of do this briefly again. If you're really curious about whether you have to pay attention to Virginia one, California one, Colorado one, talk to the lawyer and or look those up specifically. They have rules about how large the organization has to be or how many people uh, within those states the organization has to interact with. Uh, or the percentage of revenue that the organization generates from selling data. Uh, in most of them, any one of those or any one of the qualifying criteria that they have can qualify you for. Uh, in terms of penalty kind of structures, uh, the American ones are relatively normal. Um, they're sort of in the range of like five to twenty thousand dollars per violation. Uh, a violation is generally, sort of in, in implied and understood to be uh, a single instance of an individual kind of failing to exercise their rights, not like per piece of data associated with that. There's not a lot of like enforcement precedents, case law precedents about these, uh, but that's generally the way that they've been described. Uh, GDPR on the other hand is exorbitant um, it kind of describes its fines as in the tens of millions and the two or four percent of the total annual revenue of uh, an organization. Uh, the, uh, you know, I think the main reason for that is the, uh, the aim, the target of GDPR and probably the California laws uh, is most uh, obviously, I think, uh, like Facebook, uh, or, or Meta, Apple, Google. Um, it's not really designed to be about small organizations. Uh, and, and at least in the enforcement precedents that we have with GEPR over the last six years, um, uh, they haven't been very vocal about going after small organizations. I mean, they have, uh, but most of what they talk about is like, they find Meta like 1.2 billion last year and they find Amazon like a million times. Uh, but uh, in principle, the fines for GDPR, again, even for US organizations, hypothetically are up to the tens of millions of euros or a uh, percentage of revenue. I think they're structured as the higher of the two numbers. Uh, so again, the main thing that I kind of want to cover in these is like, how do they work? I think understanding how they are, uh, 
you know, how these laws are sort of structured, how they are enforced, kind of helpful to understanding what it is that you are supposed to do. And so the main thing that I want to be clear about here is that they are data privacy rights laws. The fundamental thing that they do is they give individuals, Californian citizens, Virginia citizens, Colorado citizens, EU citizens, et cetera, a set of rights that that person, that, that group of people should be able to fulfill or exercise. And organizations bear the responsibility of being able to fulfill the exercise of those rights. Uh, it does not talk about what organizations can do, can't do. It's not a sort of list of like, you can't text people, you can't cookie people, you can't use third party cookies, you can use third party cookies. That's not the way that they are structured. Um, there's very little reference to any one particular advertising channel, marketing channel technology uh, in any of these. Most of the content of them is the establishment of these rights. Um, and I'm going to go over some of the more common ones. And if you sort of think about the Venn diagram overlap of these laws, but they kind of sort of all share. They might have slightly different names uh, in the different laws, but sort of good examples of this is like right to access. So right to see the data that uh, it says people here, it should say organizations, that organizations have on you. Um, right to accuracy or rectification, right? I think rectification is a GDPR uh, language is you have a right to have inaccurate data about you updated. And in GDPR, actually, I think it goes a little bit farther to say that it's sort of a requirement of the organization to uh, use sort of reasonable business practices to keep data accurate. Uh, and so in principle, like, again, hypothetically, you can get in trouble if somebody updates in one place uh, a piece of data uh, about them, uh, about themselves, and, uh, you have that data somewhere else if sort of if you don't update it in the other place again in principle that can kind of be considered a, a violation uh right to erasure this is probably the most commonly exercised one um is uh the the right to delete the data that you have about me so whenever an organization gets one of these requests right to access right to accuracy etc and in principle the person should be able to say hey, I want you to delete every, all of this, right? Everything that you have about me and the organization has to be able to fulfill that. Uh, there are so, some of these ones at the bottom here I thought were, were interesting in that these are sort of more specific to the California laws, but are kind of copied in uh, the, the structure of the hypothetical federal one. Uh, the right to opt out of sale of your data. That was actually the sort of main focus of that first California law, CCPA. Um, and then right to non-discrimination based on your exercise of these rights, which essentially says like, you can't give me a different price. You can't sort of give me different treatment as a customer if I choose to exercise any of these rights, right? The service that you deliver me can't be based on the fact that I asked you to delete my data or something like that. Uh, and then, as, you know, emphasizing here, uh, it's not about a list of what you can or can't do. It's more about here's the rights that individuals have that you have to be able to fulfill on. And then as well, we'll kind of talk about when we get to consent, sort of combination of uh, if you want to do something, here's how you need to ask for permission for it. Um, so the, the, the other thing that I kind of really want to clarify is understanding how you may ever encounter enforcement of these laws. I think kind of wrapping your heads around like, what actually is going to happen and what do I need to be prepared for hypothetically is sort of the most important piece for understanding how these actually work. Um, so again, with the caveat that I'm not a lawyer, there may be some clandestine operation that I'm not aware of that actually makes some of these statements wrong. Uh, in practice, in the way that these laws are structured, uh, you got to be clear that infringement starts on a per person basis. There are not internet cops kind of going around the internet checking websites to see if they are compliant or not. The laws establish rights for individuals. In principle, the individuals attempt to exercise those rights. If an organization fails to fulfill the requirements that they have, so somebody says, hey, I'd like to see all the data that you have about me. I, I didn't say this earlier, but most of the laws have like time frames uh, that say, hey, you have to be able to answer this within two weeks or within four weeks. If four weeks passes and you don't uh, 
you don't uh, you know essentially show that person the data that you have about them it's at that moment that a person could contact a lawyer and say hey my rights under ccpa or gdpr or something else have been abridged and i'd like to sue this organization or, or pursue some kind of legal action um again in principle an enforcement agency can't look at your website and figure out whether you're in violation uh, i want to make an asterisk here which is like they could potentially hire people like California could hire people who are Californian citizens to go around to a bunch of websites, interact with those websites and then sort of measure whether their laws are being violated. I don't know if that's entrapment possible. I don't know. Uh, but in terms of the way that the enforcement agencies are structured, uh, the budgets that they have, uh, as far as we can tell, that does not happen. What happens is individual citizens raise these issues to the degree that they understand what these laws are and the overwhelming majority i'm going to say like every single one that has gotten any degree of notoriety is basically coordination of law firms or kind of policy or action groups who when these laws are passed say hey i'm reasonably certain facebook is violating these laws and i hate facebook uh so i'm going to kind of create uh I don't think these have been class action lawsuits. I mean, I think some of them have been class action lawsuits, but uh, basically like we're going to create a situation where we're going to have a person interact with Facebook, you know, wait for them to violate one or more of these laws. And then we're going to bring a case against uh, uh, Facebook again in uh, the Eurozone or in California within the regulatory framework of these. Um, I asked ChatGPT to draw me a three panel comic of uh what this looks like this is what it spat out and it was so funny that i felt uh i had to share it with you all uh what this is supposed to depict is an individual interacting with a website noticing that one of his uh or their like you know data privacy rights have been violated in this case your data has been sold without consent uh contacting a lawyer uh to, <laughs> to raise this issue and then this was supposed to be uh kind of following up with the website the whatever this organization represented by the website um to uh to essentially kind of bring some kind of legal action what has ended up happening is that somehow the lawyer aged in reverse like 50 years from the shock and awe of whatever's going on here um, but the, the thing I hoped to get out of this was just like kind of uh, hammering home that this happens on an individual basis. It happens to users of your website or, or whatever kind of digital presence that you have. Um, it's not the enforcement agencies that are going to uh, come after you overwhelmingly. Uh, so to, to give a kind of uh, more full example of this, uh, right to access. So this is sort of a pretty common one. User requests to see the data that you have of them, right? So you have to be able to kind of furnish all of the data that you've collected for them uh, uh, whenever they make this request. Once you show them that data, this is kind of something to keep in mind, the ways in which that this could kind of get complicated is they may then subsequently question uh, the authority that you had or have to collect some of that data, right? So for example, if the data that you show of this person shows them receiving marketing emails, they might, or certainly if a lawyer is handling this, you know, might say, hey, show me the record that you have of this person consenting to receiving these emails. And this is an idea that's kind of going to be carried forward in the rest of this presentation is that recording the grant of consent, that actual kind of record of when they said yes to something uh, is like really critically important in the hypothetical scenario wherein you might face some kind of enforcement or litigation about this. Uh, they may also subsequently request that data be deleted, right? So you might show them, hey, here's all the data that I have about you. Uh, they, they might say, hey, delete this uh, uh, for me. Um, then th this kind of poses a kind of challenging question. We're going to get into the part of the presentation where there's not going to be a lot of super clear answers about stuff, uh, but there's a possibility 
that you have access to some of this information in order to be able to delete it. And in some cases, depending on some vendors, you might not have direct access to be able to delete it. And that kind of creates a complicated web of responsibility, which is like who actually uh, is responsible for de deleting this. I also want to highlight uh, a potential risk factor here to think about. This actually came up with one of our customers relatively recently, is that there is a risk of asymmetric information, meaning the person or sort of person slash lawyer who's contacting you may already know what data you should have for this user, right? So the, the, all the person has to do to exercise this right is to say, show me the data that you have about me. In principle, if they're doing this in a really uh, intentional way, which is they're trying to find an issue, they actually might say, hey, I know the data that you're supposed to have about me. So I, I went to our website uh, and I uh, looked up, uh, for anybody who has never done this, you can bring up uh, developer tools. One of the tabs in the developer tools is you can see every single like web request that goes out whenever you load up a website. And so on our website, you'll see some Feather stuff, you'll see some Facebook stuff, you'll see uh, some Google Ads stuff, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so it's possible, again, we had, we had this situation with one of our customers where you might get a request for like, show me all the data that you have about me. They might have an, already an expectation of what they're supposed to get back. And if the data that they get back is missing, a sort of a particular piece that they expect to be in there based on something like this or some other research that they've done, which is like, hey, I know you're tracking this data or you're sending this kind of data to another vendor, then that's a potential risk factor for uh, asymmetry in uh, being able to furnish all of the data that you have about somebody. This is also one of the most complicated, unclear, um, so without being too judgmental about the intention of these uh, kind of like laws and regulatory frameworks, like you don't have access to data on Google. You might use Google ads, uh, but like you as an individual, as a marketer, can't go look up the data for an individual user on Google. It, actually, they have to do that. And it's not clear, like, do the laws correctly capture that? Or are you somehow in violation for not being able to show a person the data that your website enabled Google to track on your behalf in, in some sense? Um, uh, but I also want to uh, kind of, again, to further kind of clarify how this works. How do these interactions work with a vendor sort of like Feather, like Google, for example? Uh, it's the organization, so in this case, if we're talking about our customers, the nonprofit that is responsible for being able to fulfill one of these data slash rights requests, right? It's a donor, it's a member of your association that will ask you to see their data, to delete their data, to update their data, whatever that particular exercise right is. You then work with or through your compendium of vendors to affect that request, right? So if it's sort of right to access, again, in principle, it's gonna sound like really laborious. You gotta go around to every vendor that you may use as a part of marketing, as a part of analytics, as a part of anything and go like, hey, what data do you have about user X, Y, Z? Uh, and then you gotta uh, aggregate that all up, collate it, and then give it back to user X, Y, Z. Uh, if, if anybody is curious, uh, or th there's a, you know, you can kind of like see a particular challenge here, which is if you use like MailChimp and Google ads, you know, use MailChimp for email, use Google ads for advertising, you got to go to both of those places, right? And user XYZ might have requested something. You got to go to MailChimp and say, hey, MailChimp, what data do you have about user XYZ? Um, and you got to, th this is the sort of impossible one, Google ads what data do you have about user XYZ? That button actually does not exist. Uh, there's no way for you to do that. You have to instruct the user to then go ask Google ads to see that data. I'm actually, uh, I, I know Google can fulfill on their data privacy requests. Um, I don't know if it's possible to actually segregate out, hey, I want to see the data that you collected for me only within the context of this particular Google ads account. I know uh, a while ago when I looked into this, that was not a filter that was available um, and, and is sort of one of the weaknesses of, of these laws. 
Uh, if you're wondering well, what responsibility do vendors have uh, over the last six years since GDPR, most vendors have made kind of some version of what used to be called data protection addendums, sort of standard to their terms and conditions, which is uh, in 2018, I remember there was a bunch of uh, uh, work around like making these contract uh, and terms addendums. They're like, hey, if I ask you for this information on behalf of user XYZ, you got to give it to me. Um, and so now most vendors just have in their standard terms and conditions in the context of data privacy compliance, we will fulfill on you know, sort of standard data requests, whatever, like that that's our commitment as a vendor to you is that we recognize our responsibility in those interactions and, and we will provide those, uh, those pieces of data to you. Uh, I want to show uh, an example of what this looks like on Feather. So I think uh, Rachel has got to... Uh, turn this on for me. So let me switch tabs uh, and go here. Um, so actually, I have no clue like what the distribution of people on the call are Feather customers or not Feather customers. Um, but th this is Feather. This is uh, I've already clicked into the community section, which is sort of where you see the data about the people that you have. And I'm going to use an example, a really sort of quick one using one of our employees because I'm in our sandbox environment, which is what happens if I get a request from Kristen Zeke, who's our director of support, uh, about fulfilling one of her data sort of privacy requests. Um, and I'm going to show off, wink, wink, why Feather is sort of very good and makes this process very easy, where it's very complicated in a couple of other places. So the first thing, like just sort of access to data, uh, the ability to see it is Feather keeps every piece of data for all users. Uh, our, our sort of personal vocabulary for each one of these things uh, is a breadcrumb. And if you saw here, when I searched uh, in the community tab, for Kristen, I, I could also do it by her email. So that's typically how you know one of these requests might come in. Is you get an email from a user, uh, they'd say their name, they'd say, I want to see all the data that you have about me. Uh, we've seen, I can't see the app. Tells me Rachel. Why not? You can't see the thing that I'm looking at. One second, technical difficulties. The, the glitch free run has ended. <clears throat> All right, Rachel, I'm looking at you to tell me whether you can see the app or not, or potentially somebody in chat. Does anybody see the thing I'm playing with right now and typing in names and stuff? Okay, Declan, Declan what's up, Declan? We can see the app and Kristen Zeke. I haven't seen Declan in potentially years. I'm not sure. Um, but so, okay, I get this request from uh, Kristen. So I'll come in here and I'll say, I wanna see the data that I have about Kristen. Um, and so we, uh, perfect. We uh, store every piece of uh, data here. Uh, you can request for us to export this in just kind of like a, a linear sort of spreadsheet for uh, a particular user. Um, and so you can share this uh, with uh, with this particular individual if they kind of wanted to say, hey, what's the data that you have about me? That will also uh, kind of contain um, what you might sort of be thinking about as like, what's the data that you have about this user, which is whatever sort of CRM like data you might have about this person. Right. So like, you know, you, you might have recorded their address, their name, their job title, whatever, right? So all of those things can be included as well, as, as well as any custom data fields that your organization may have set up. Keep in mind, this is our uh, test environment. So there's a bunch of uh, hypothetical fields in here. Um, but I wanted to pinpoint one sort of specific example, which is, so you share this data with somebody, uh, and I, I looked at this uh, yesterday, right? So uh here i can filter by kristen received an email and there, it'll show me every single email and associated campaign that it received with right and so this would be a part of the delivery of the data that you give this person they might say okay show me the proof that like you're allowed to email this person that you didn't uh buy this email address somewhere and so another thing that is stored in feather sort of forever is uh, form submission. So had Kristen 
signed up for our newsletter or whatever, our marketing emails through a form on our website, then the piece of data that would be stored is the submission of that form. Now, in this case, this particular form is not that kind of form. It was not a sign up for a newsletter. Um, but had you been a, a, a in this hypothetical scenario, if this were a Feather customer who was tracking newsletter subscriptions or marketing subscriptions through Feather, this piece of data about the submission of this form would be available if anybody's curious. This is like what the actual underlying data uh, uh, is. Uh, then uh, you could share that as proof, which is uh, in this case, this particular form submission, June 4th, 2024, Kristen submitted a form on this page, which you know for you all might be like organization.org slash newsletter sign up or homepage or something, but it would have the identification of the form. It could also have custom data in it associated with, uh, this is the submission for the, uh, for the form. Uh, Alexandra has a question who is, would it be required to share the internal notes about the person? I guess it depends what internal notes uh, are. You are, uh, you have to share any data that is essentially theirs that, that they have given you or is about them. So their location, their address, uh, their uh, job title, their email address, whatever. Um, if uh, for whatever reason in your organization, you know, like you can write notes about somebody, uh, I, I don't, that, that doesn't count as personal information. I'm reasonably certain. All the caveats about that, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, um, but the, that kind of data is not uh, sort of uh, referenced or talked about in, in these laws. You don't have to see, if you're like talking trash about somebody, you don't have to show people that. Uh, so anyway, the, I'm gonna unshare this and switch tabs back and hopefully this works uh and so now i want to talk uh, a little bit about like what is consent how do i manage it what are some of the pitfalls and kind of challenges and why maybe some help um would be uh might be helpful to people uh so core elements of consent as defined in these kind of data privacy laws uh this language is I believe from CCPA, maybe GDPR, they give very, very similar language, uh, is that consent is defined as any freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous indication of the consumer's wishes uh, by which they, by a statement or by a clear affirmative action, signify agreement to the processing of personal data relating to them. Uh, it's a mouthful. I've, I've sort of highlighted some of the more meaningful components of that definition. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what those supposedly mean with all of the caveats that like very little of this has been sort of tried or tested in court, not actually clear what a lot of this technically means. Um, consent being specific in principle, you can kind of think about that as applying to a particular channel uh, or applying to a particular use of data, right? So channel would be like, marketing email for marketing uh, uh, or SMS for marketing, right? That's one potential definition of specific. There are some people who interpret specific to mean even a, a, a kind of finer layer of uh, categorization, which is, you know, consent means you can use my email for marketing of this type, but not of that type. Right. So marketing being like marketing of your organization, you can use it for that. But you got to get separate consent for using my email for marketing for other organizations, meaning potentially the sale of my email address to somebody else. Um, and I also want to say that that kind of the ownership of that consent is the responsibility of the organization, in this case, the nonprofit, not like the vendor. Feather is not responsible for making sure that you have consent for tracking data with us, right? Google is not responsible for doing that. The, the requests come to you, uh, the kind of the capture uh, and questioning of whether you have the relevant consent to have done that. But again, it's ultimately up to the organization. Feather or other places can help you capture that consent and in, in the case of Feather, like store that consent. Um, but it's not a like Feather's not responsibility is not making sure you have consent for capturing the data that you should. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, this is not really a, a defining the laws, but the actual record of grant of consent is sort of an important question and this a relatively new concept in terms of data to store, which is 
you, you want to have a record of the uh, the actual grant of consent. Kind of took this picture from the example that I just gave you, which is like storing the form fill where hypothetically Kristen said, hey, I'd like to register for this newsletter. And so that you could potentially show, hey, on January 4th, uh, or sorry, June 4th, 2024, uh, on this website, you submitted our newsletter form. We can see here, this is where your email was filled out and, and you uh, kind of like knowingly submitted that you were consenting to that. Um, in the context of uh, text messaging, of, uh, of other contact direct mail, that sort of records of consent may look different, right? It might be a box that they check during a registration form. But then essentially the idea would be you want to make sure you store that they had that box checked in and that you can look up, did they have that box checked in? Um, consent management, very again, we just want to give a brief overview of like, what does this mean? What does it not mean? Kind of what's the sort of ambiguous uh, uh, sort of potential pitfalls. You've all seen some version of these things. These are uh, sort of a spectrum of cookie consent boxes. So particularly these two on the right are more like cookie consent. The one on the left, this company, Klim, Klim maybe, uh, is a consent management platform uh, itself. Uh, and so this potentially extends to not just cookies. Uh, it, it's asking for consent for other things, but it's sort of managing it in a, in a UI that sort of looks like just cookie consent management. Whereas, you know, this one, is just cookies, doesn't cover email, doesn't cover SMS, uh, et cetera. Uh, and this one is a slightly more kind of verbose or sophisticated, but again, cookie consent kind of management uh, page. Uh, the thing that I wanna clarify for everybody who potentially has one of these, is actually not quite sure uh, how these work, um, is that this like does not happen automatically, uh, meaning, uh, there's no standard right now for what the hell these little boxes do, or there's not an effective standard. Standard. There are attempts at standards, but there's not a standard for what these little boxes actually do and indicate uh, that other vendors like us, like Google, like Meta can then kind of ask or scan and say, hey, I do or do not have consent to track this piece of data. Um, to kind of correctly implement these things, there's typically a kind of complicated follow-up, which is depending on what somebody configures or what somebody presses, um, then uh, you need to uh, do or not do something later. Again, in this in this case, on the context of your web page, uh, I see Alexander has a question. If somebody sends an email to me personally saying, "Yeah, you can sign me up for your newsletter," and I add them manually, does that count, or do they need to opt in on a form? Yeah, with all the caveats that I'm not a lawyer, as far as I understand, that would qualify as affirmative consent. They did a specific thing, they were informed, um, and if you could find that email, right, it would satisfy for your purposes, uh, like here's the record of them consenting to, to receiving our marketing emails. Uh, okay, uh, so I wanna kind of like uh, showcase, this is, I'm not kidding, one of the less complicated charts that I could find as an example of how these consent platforms are supposed to work. And I'm, and I'm really kind of trying to paint a picture here that this is kind of impossible for almost every single organization, you know, other than a hospital uh, or a, like really large global uh, S&P 100 um, kind of scale company to implement which is that like everything that you do in your organization has to check with some kind of central consent management framework. Can I do this? So like basically almost nobody in the world does what I'm about to say, but in principle, um, uh, like before you send an email, there's supposed to be some kind of connection where it checks with some kind of central repository or some sort of repository, do I have permission to send this email to this person, right? Is the, uh, is the consent active? Is it valid? Has it expired? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is not how it ever works. 
uh, I believe for the people asking, uh, I think the webinar is available and the deck uh, certainly will be available. Um, uh, the question is how do we manage unsubscribes and how do we how do we export unsubscribes? I think if you mean in the context of Feather specifically, uh, that's assuming you're a Feather customer, uh, then that question would best go to support. They'll be able to answer that with more visual resources and aids than I currently have available to me. Um, but like in principle, this is what consent management is supposed to look like, right? If you're texting people uh, that before a text message ever goes out, uh, that there's some kind of central consent framework that is checked. Uh, and again, it's updated, it's validated, whatever. It's like, this basically does not happen. There's almost no organization save for, I think, you know, large medical organizations that actually do this this well. Uh, and so I want to reiterate when you're kind of thinking about like what you can actually do and how you should think about consent uh, is that thinking about the enforcement mechanism. Nobody is actively checking. Do all of your systems, are they checking? Are they crossing the threads, doing whatever uh, in order to be able to uh, evaluate whether your organization is compliant or not? Really, the question that you have to ask is like, am I set up well to be able to answer one of these requests as so thoroughly as is reasonable, right? So if somebody comes in and says, hey, can you show me all the data that you have about me? It's a California citizen, right? Um, and maybe they're poking around because they're trying to be an asshole, or maybe they just have a sort of genuine question, which is like, I'm, I'm just curious to see all the data that you have about me. You make a reasonable effort towards showing them all of the data that you in principle have about them, right? And when kind of thinking about the risk for your organization, sort of compliance is like, you're really thinking about, can I answer those people? Can I affect what those people want? If they say, hey, can you delete this data about me? Do I have access to being able to delete that data about that particular user or update it if updating it is their uh, request? So with that in mind, that you're not being measured actually against that uh, like crazy spreadsheet and also the not spreadsheet uh, flow chart and that I'm not a lawyer, uh, this is not sort of uh, permanent legal advice. So like realistic goals and tips uh, to kind of come away from like, what should I be doing to manage my consent better? Uh, one is remember that you are not being graded against perfect. Uh, your actual responsibility is to be able to respond to these kinds of requests. If somebody says, show me my data, you know, like, hey, can, can, can you show me when I uh, signed up for this newsletter or that I did sign up for this newsletter? Can you show me, you know, where you got my phone number and that I consented to you texting me if, if uh, text messaging is a part of your organization? Like, that's actually the thing that you should be preparing for, um, not like if before every text message goes out, are you checking some kind of central consent management uh, place? I would say do the basics. So capture and store cookie, email marketing, if, if SMS is a part of your marketing plan, uh, consent. Uh, uh, occasionally test uh, that uh, you, you can find them. Uh, I think sort of running these tests for yourself as individuals, for random people in your organization is helpful. Um, and this last thought here is I'm hamming it up. Uh, partner with a marketing or advertising platform that can help you set this up. Um, and that would be Feather. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of make a plug for like, uh, this can be really difficult and daunting to set up correctly to kind of make sure that you can access these things and sort of in line with everything that we do, uh, Feather is sort of designed to make these things as easy as possible for you. Um, either the, Hey, I already have a consent management framework set up, uh, um, uh, and I want to make sure that Feather is complying with that. We can certainly help you uh, set those things up. Uh, and or, hey, I'm actually like not sure at all how to set up a consent management platform, how to make sure that Feather or Google Ads or Facebook like do or don't fire based on that. We have a whole uh, data integration team uh, that helps with the implementations of those kinds of things. But thank you all very much. Uh, for being uh, such wonderful and gracious uh, listeners and participants. And thank you for all the questions. I am going to say goodbye. So goodbye.